on today's Emerging Tech Horizons, how to automate the Department of Defense. One thing is essential to accelerate decisions. You need innovation that fits the mission. We innovate from AI to zero trust. We integrate using open APIs that you control. We automate with smart solutions so warfighters know and act faster. Your mission accelerated. Tomorrow's challenges anticipated. Win faster with Booz Allen. Hello and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Arun Serafin, Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the development of autonomous technologies for the Department of Defense and how industry and government are working together to speed the development and delivery of those capabilities. As everybody knows, the use of autonomous technologies is growing in the Department of Defense and it touches all of the various mission areas, whether they're very, very tactical missions or even back office missions. We also all know that autonomous technologies are not the sole purview of the Department of Defense or even of the federal government. They're growing in the commercial sector as well. And so thinking about how the Department of Defense positions itself best to make use of its own autonomous capabilities as well as commercial autonomous capabilities and then move those to support its missions in the best interest of taxpayers and warfighters is a very complex issue. Fortunately for us today, to help us understand all of that and disentangle that complex issue, I'm proud to have Randy Amata, Vice President of Booz Allen Hamilton, as my guest today. Thanks for joining us, Randy. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Booz Allen is a member of NDIA. They're a sponsor of the ETI Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. Thank you for that. As well as an active participant in a lot of NDIA activities. So um, Randy is a uh, vice president at Booz Allen. He leads technical teams in signal processing and control systems for AI, autonomous systems, electronic warfare, space systems, and other things. For example, Randy oversees Booz Allen's engineering labs across the United States. I'll tell you the truth, I didn't know Booz Allen had engineering labs across the United States, focused on robotics, cyber physical systems, and RF, free, uh, RF systems as well. Um, Randy, um, thanks for joining us again. Um, let's just start by saying I didn't do you justice at all with your bio. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your career path and what you're doing now at Booz Allen? Sure, Arun, and once again, thanks so much for, uh, for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so once again, Randy Yamada, uh, backgrounds in signal processing, electrical engineering. Uh, I've been at Booz Allen for uh, just over 18 years now, and I've spent a majority of my time there deploying novel capabilities for the warfighter. That's really been my, my focus area. And um, you know, Booz Allen as a company has been an amazing place to grow uh, and develop as an engineer, to get an opportunity to you know, look at problems very holistically from the beginning conceptual stage all the way to the complexities of deploying something you know, out into the field. And I think progressively throughout my career, I've gotten an opportunity to do more and more complex uh, tasks and jobs, more and more uh, current and state-of-the-art uh, technologies, and honestly make uh, ideally or hopefully as big of an impact as we possibly can. So Booz Allen. Um... Probably everyone's heard of Booz Allen and has sort of a sense of they know what this company does, uh, but it's a big company. Um, I tell you the truth, I think about Booz Allen, I first think of consulting and I think of commercial work with some federal work. And I know it's this, you know, large company that does all these different things. Can you give us sort of one over the world of what Booz Allen does? And I'm really curious, I didn't know you had engineering labs, so what do those do, for example? Yeah. So. Um... Fantastic question, and I wish it were the first time I've heard that <laughs> that exact characterization of the company. So, so first of all, we've been around for about 110 years, um, celebrating our 110-year um, anniversary this year. And I think it's um, the best way to characterize the company is that we are mission-focused. So most engagements that people have with Booz Allen, they may not realize that um, there is a dedicated team in that location supporting that client and so uh, folks might get a very very narrow view of the 
breadth of capabilities that we actually have. But I think as a um, as a major you know punctuating point, uh, we've got a significant mission focus, huge support across the entire DoD uh, intelligence community, uh, as well as uh, the civil sector, and um, I think you know I'll, I'll maybe say it one more time, you know, entirely mission focused. So whatever it takes to help our clients accomplish what they need to accomplish, we're there. And that absolutely includes uh, engineering services. So in, when I think about engineering services, then, you know, there's Booz Allen people supporting, let's say, government program offices to help them be smarter buyers. I've seen that. Um, I've seen drifting over to the more almost management consulting thinking about organizational policy issues, supporting that. <clears throat> Booz Allen people, of course, do both unclass and classified work, uh, as, as my understanding. I did not really realize how much technical engineering work goes on. So again, so tell, tell me a little bit about the kinds of people that are doing that kind of work, where it's being done, what are the kinds of products? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. I think um, the, the best way to answer it to represent the uh, the thousands and thousands of folks that work at Booz Allen really is, you know, where is the uh, leading edge state of the art technology that uh, our clients, that the, the DOD, the US government is trying to deploy to solve uh, the nation's problems. And I think if you were to lay those out on a sheet of paper and try to choose one where Booz Allen isn't either uh, investing in uh, to get up ahead of the curve, uh, or you know, co-investing with our clients or delivering capability to our clients, um, I, I think you'd be very hard pressed to find one. So I, I struggle to choose one technology or one facet of uh, you know the current state of the art, just because uh, we are trying very hard to cover the gamut to bring our clients that that total spectrum of value. But the Booz Allen people, then you know, they're sitting in your their own lab space. I'm assuming they're sitting in government lab space. They're helping at test ranges, all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Right. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, might be suit and tie at a desk, maybe uh, you know, jeans and a t-shirt. Um, in boots. And, in boots, right. you know, holding know. wrenches. Your beat in all of this is autonomy, at least one of your beats. Um, and again, I could pigeonhole Booz Allen and say, oh, you guys think about you know, processing data for the personnel system or something like that. But again, I'm going to miss the scope here. So what's the scope of work that Booz Allen's thinking about these days in autonomy? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I'll take a, a step back a little bit and, and maybe talk a little bit about even just the definition of autonomy. And what's very interesting is that um, you know, a lot of people may not see you know, when we talk about autonomy, everyone's got an individual vision for what that really means based on you know, their lens of how they think about the problem and, and where they decide to apply it. Um, I think point number one, autonomy is a operational game changer for almost every mission that the DOD and the US government has you know, out there. That's sort of big point number one. The second is there's this great spectrum um, wherein we used to deploy, or where we still do deploy and invest in these exquisite systems that the DOD supports. And if you think about it as, you know, on, on one end where we have these exquisite systems that require piloting by human beings, and on this other end, um, the DOD leadership vision of what they're calling autonomous mass or fully autonomous mass. So lots of low cost um, uh, autonomous platforms managing themselves. Like in a program like Replicator. Exactly. For example. There are a lot of steps along the way there. And really that first major step was uh, to get to remote piloting, right? So to have a, a pilot of a vehicle not sitting in the physical platform itself and have them separated. Um, and there's a, a spectrum from even there to where you have sort of autonomous independent systems, systems that can manage themselves and then uh, ultimately get to this vision of, of a fully autonomous mass. And so, you know, you, when you see Booz Allen across these sort of spectrum of programs that have existed for decades already within the DOD, and some that are wildly brand new, um, we are supporting those in different kinds of ways uh, that we believe are best to help our clients where they need to go. So for example, some might be in uh, thought leadership and uh, 
coming up with novel applications that might solve some of these future problems. Others might be uh, much more detailed architecture, systems engineering uh, work. Others might be rapid prototyping and actually getting systems deployed. Developing hardware and software. Developing hardware and software and getting them out into the field and used. Um, and, and my characterization is often, you know, what, what are our, our clients trying to achieve and accomplish and how can we best help them get there? So uh, DOD's faced with all of these different missions, many of which require or could benefit from the use of autonomy. Um, we, you know, tactical things like replicator are one end of the spectrum. I actually am also very interested in what I call back office missions. Uh, I don't know when DOD is going to use any particular weapon system. I do know they're going to be processing payroll and writing contracts every day forever. So how do you think about, and how does Booz Allen think about using maybe commercial technologies to support those kinds of missions, the back office missions? Yeah, so that, that's a... Um... That's a fantastic question and a fantastic point. And I think that's, that's a big sticking point for me. So uh, I guess response number one is that um, there are still a big population of folks out there that think about autonomy uh, as a tool, right? As a tool that I, as a person, am going to deploy at one point when I need that tool. And when you think about it that way, often it becomes difficult to really realize the total value of what it can be. And, and we've started to use the phrase um, that autonomy transforms missions uh, or can transform missions and may not necessarily just be for use in a mission, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so if we deploy autonomy the right way, it can fundamentally change how we are accomplishing this, these missions. And I know that the uh, DOD leadership is, is pushing that vision uh, through. But for example, um, and to your second question around commercial systems, I think, you know, this is imperative. We, or the DOD, has relied on what they've called dual-use technologies, or technologies that uh, have been born in the commercial world, uh, developed in the commercial world, and lean on a lot of commercial uh, funding, and then uh, pulled that in for military use or military application later. And I think as uh, anybody who's grown up in this generation looks around at the amazing technologies that have been built first in the commercial world, uh, or at least accelerated through uh, the commercial world, I don't see a universe where we're not leaning on those technologies to make you know, autonomy a reality. I think compute is a fantastic example. I think modeling and simulation uh, that has been developed uh, across the commercial space is another wonderful example. Um, I think there are uh, uh, majority of um, homegrown software applications uh, or commercial grown software applications, commercial grade software applications that can also be brought through and used. And applied to defense missions. Absolutely. Right. And like you said, sometimes the flow is the other way. We always talk about things that people don't know DOD helped invent. People think about internet, GPS, touch screen, computer mouse, integrated circuits, right? All DOD things that they then sort of transition over to the commercial sector and the commercial sector runs and does amazing things with it. And then you get to this challenge, which I'd like to touch to, even those things where DOD and times when DOD invents something and the commercial sector starts to run with it, or even DOD itself starts to develop it more, DOD struggles to then make use of the technology. So what's the assessment today on relative to the possibilities, how are we doing in adopting autonomy into the various mission sets? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I think if you kind of go back and look at that paradigm, that spectrum, I think, um, honestly, that the DOD is really leading in the adoption of some of these technologies. So let's talk first about, for example, remote piloting. You know, DOD, I think, was the first, um, you know, and really made... Um, Popular is not the right word. Really made possible possible remote piloting. So you know, in the spectrum of technologies, from remote piloting all the way to you know future autonomy, I think the DoD is reducing tremendous amounts of risk uh, up front with adoption of the technologies. And it is nice to see a good co-investment between commercial industry, you know, and the DoD on this technology, so that uh, that you know there is an opportunity for businesses to succeed and reduce. 
significant risk around things, for example, like, um, uh, you know, around updating software around autonomous systems and, and putting a lot of uh, hours behind testing and evaluating autonomous systems, uh, wherein the DOD can push forward on a lot of the foundational technologies required to get that job done. So there's challenges, though, with the adoption of autonomy technologies or any new technologies. Let me just rattle off some of the typical challenges. Tell me what your, your sense of this is. One of the things you touched on earlier was this notion that you know, DOD develops something, but then has to position itself to buy it back. A link in there is requirements. Um, and it's sometimes difficult for the government to know what's commercially possible and then set up a requirement. And that requirement then drives money and creates programs. How do you feel like the government is starting to wrap its arms around how it adjusts its requirements to take advantage of commercial technologies? Yeah, and I, I, uh, that's an amazing question. And I really wish I had a, a reasonable answer to that. But, but there is one thing that I'm seeing in this industry that is very attractive from a, uh, uh, you know, both an industry and, and a military perspective. And that is around um, uh, accelerating, you know, the deployment a lot of a lot of these uh, systems, um, not only deployment, but also uh, specifying requirements, uh, acquisition of said uh, systems, you know, and acting on them more quickly. I think, you know, we are moving away from a universe where you know, you have five years to acquire a capability and then expect to have that fielded for the next 35 years. Just because technology moves so fast. Technology is moving so fast. And we've seen this in a lot of other places. I think there's great analogies in the, in the cell phone market, um, in the personal computer space, where, you know, once you get to the point where the hardware refresh cycle uh, gets to a, like a very attractive, um, fast rate, that you can see more rapid adoption entrance into the competition space. So for example, in the software uh, development market, and if uh, hardware can keep up with the latest in technology appropriately, then you have this very, very robust development around software. And what we've seen, especially, you know, in the cell phone space, you know, there's certain techniques um, that have allowed performance to just get amazingly good. And one of them was uh, creating a system where you need to refresh your phone every two or so years. And, you know, if you go back 20 years, that was kind of a, a novel life limit to put on a cell phone or even a personal computer. But now we see that that's not only accepted, but it's sort of expected. Um, it, it allows people to stay at the top end with technology. It helps keep prices down. Uh, it's generated a lot of um, reusable software that allows the overall cost of the software to come down. I think there's a lot of amazing impacts of just that aspect of of the autonomy space. Yeah, but this idea of disposable systems, even if, like you said, they're enabled by software um, and they're required because technology moves so fast, it's going to be a cultural change for the Department of Defense to think about buying more disposable systems, whether we're talking about drones or vehicles or something like that. But you know, to your point, the more disposable a system is, the shorter its life cycle, it's honestly easier for the department to buy. And if you think about the way the department buys power or food, it's very different than the systems it uses to buy aircraft carriers or helicopters. But if everything was more sort of down to that end of the spectrum where it's, I'm just going to buy this and I'm going to throw it away in two years, I'm going to buy software as a service, and it, it might make DOD's bureaucratic life easier and make things move, move along quicker. How, does any of that resonate with your experience? Do you see any hope along those lines? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ecstatic, actually, to see <laughs> that. And You're ecstatic about I, DOD. I, I, whoa, at, about my work and life every day. <laughs> um, we're seeing from DOD leadership specifically, uh, they're using a term, attributable, you know, which is a relatively new term that we've, we've seen out there. And, and we're still looking for some specifics around that. But, but I love where the direction that that's going in because, you know, the term disposable kind of creates a, a negative connotation that we don't necessarily want to call them disposable. You know, it's not a, a razor that we should be tossing out every time we, you know, unwrap the package. Uh, but there is a nice happy medium between we're going to use this one time 
and you'll be expected to use this system for the next Air 35 Air years. It's going to fly, it's going to sail around for 80 years. Right. right. And, and I, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, evidence with acquisition and how programs are going to be run that are helping to enable that vision. So, so one example is uh, driving towards these open architectures. Uh, so one uh, very popular one called MOSA, the Modular Open System Architecture. Right. Uh, the, the Navy is very um, hot on the unmanned maritime uh, autonomy architecture, or Yuma, and and these are you know sort of systems engineering constructs that help decouple hardware from software. Something that you know if if the government weren't playing a positive role in pushing, right? Uh, companies may not be incentivized to do so. Right. right. You couple your software tightly with your hardware, you get a little bit of extra performance. But it makes it very difficult to. But if you could split the buy of the hardware and software, you could maybe speed up the process of refreshing that software, even if your hardware stays in place. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, I mean, get... it is, the equivalent would be imagine a world where you bought your fuel with the car, and then when you had to replace the fuel, you had to buy a new car every single time. That's right. And I haven't heard that analogy, but that's a great one. But, you yeah. know, that's sort of what we do with the software side, right? So, um, okay, now over on the commercial side, what gives you some hope that commercial technologies, which often are developed in a very different environment in terms of security, in terms of uh, foreign uh, use of the technology, globally available technologies, which doesn't always work for DOD, are you seeing behaviors that say commercial autonomy is going to be used more frequently? Absolutely. And I think um, you know there, there's one interesting observation. So you're absolutely right. The uh, constructs, the requirements, the objectives may all be slightly different, but there are certainly things that we can learn and take away from what's being done in the commercial side. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is when you look at a lot of these um, uh, autonomous car, commercial car manufacturers, and you look at the rate at which they're updating their software. Um, I, I don't know if anybody really predicted that prior, you know, maybe 10 years ago. But, but uh, we're seeing reports of software updates going out, for example, three times, four times a week, right? Which is quite staggering. Um, when we look at that, barring all these other differences that you mentioned, you know, that, that, that's a very interesting takeaway that, you know, unlike the traditional systems engineering process around acquiring a system where you specify all the requirements to a T, you go through a year or two of acceptance testing and you have your system, right, there's a much more kind of agile iteration driven approach that even in the commercial sector is is turning out to be acceptable. And that, you know, I think we absolutely can can learn something from from what they're experiencing there. And so your booze folks are then both at the technical end of the spectrum experimenting, prototyping, testing the technologies, but then trying to shape the uh, policy environment that creates these business processes and support the people executing. Do I have that right in all of those different parts of the, of the of the life cycle, let's say, of the procurement use of an autonomous system? Yeah, I like to say, you know, we, we support our clients uh, where they are. Um, and, you know, in, especially in this technology area, as important as autonomy, I mean, we, we are, uh, at least that is my major focus, you know, in this company. So when you see all that, You'll have to admit the world isn't perfect. So uh, what if you could change things? What are the biggest challenges that you would love to overcome and, and maybe idea or two on ideas of how we start to try to overcome? Um, you know, I think, I think timeline is really important. And, you know, we're hearing that a lot uh, from a user perspective, from a leadership perspective, from the technical perspective. Uh, the, the timelines um, feel very short, but at the same time, they're not fast enough. So, you know, if I had my druthers, I would accelerate a lot of the work that's being done. You know, I would get projects started immediately. I'd burn down risk. And, and I think... And that's just, is that cultural change? Is that legal change? Is that regulatory change? You know, I, that, that's an amazing question. And I wish I knew that's outside of my expertise area. But, but I think we have... Um, uh, in fact, I think it's probably all of the above. Yeah, maybe it's not a capital C change, uh, but I do hope to see acceleration in the near term. So, uh, you know, we talked a lot about all the different ways Booz works with the government. 
Um, how do you work with small businesses and universities? NDAA has got a lot of those kinds of members as well. What are some typical engagements with those kinds of organizations? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm very proud to say that, you know, in my own personal opinion, you know, we've been told that, uh, or I've been told specifically that Booz Allen is a, is a great partner to work with. Um, we as, corporately look at a lot of these problems. And in fact, we have this phrase written in one of our flagship facilities on the wall. Uh, and it says, don't go it alone. And, you know, we really are steeped culturally in forming a good team that, uh, you know, the, to deliver the best value and capability to our clients. Usually it's not one company going at it alone. So we, we are extremely open to building teams, to forming teams. We've got lots of contacts across the industry. And, you know, it, again, I'll say from, from the top, uh, from our leadership, you know, all the way throughout our company, we're really focused on, you know, kind of building the right team for the problem set at hand and, and for our clients. So I'm assuming that gets into you subcontract with small businesses. You are a subcontractor to big and small businesses. You enter into research partnerships with universities. I'm sure you've got internship programs and fellowship programs and all of that sort of stuff as well. That's so, absolutely right. Um, uh, subcontracting, prime contracting, as you mentioned, uh, cooperative research and development agreements, not only with the universities, but also with, um, uh, with the government you know, research labs themselves. I don't think there is a uh, mechanism that we wouldn't use to you know, pull the right team together. So time for a couple more things. One is, so DOD, Silicon Valley, everybody sort of doing a lot of navel gazing and gnashing of teeth about how are we ever going to integrate this commercial view of the world and this defense view of the world. But you're a company that's been doing that for, I guess, 110 years. How is it that you have succeeded straddling that, both sides of that? commercial military um, line and producing products for both sides. You know, uh, and just to set the record straight, I have not been working <laughs> at the company for 110 years. But if I were, um, you know, I, I think, so actually it's, it's, a, it's an amazing question and very, very difficult to answer. But the mechanisms are in place, you know, to do so. And I, I sort of mentioned some of the systems engineering you know, approaches that we're starting to see, um, I shouldn't say starting, they've been around for quite some time, but that are championed by the government. So these open architecture uh, approaches. Um, and, and I think that is that is uh, maybe the most important point to me is right. that, you know, that there is very specific engineering steps that you can take to enforce uh, aspects of a system that will get, I think, the impact. Whether it's a want. commercial customer, or de defense mission. There's some core steps, but is there a is is there a Booz Allen defense that's separate from Booz Allen? We have a uh, defense sector within Booz Allen. Booz Allen is one company. Right. Okay. And the people flow a little bit here and there between them, and you you sort of capture ideas from both sides. Oh, right? absolutely. We that's have uh, mechanisms within the company to facilitate, um, you know, ideas flowing from one sector uh, to another. Um, you know, technical, uh, functional, you know, leadership and skills from one place to another. I mean, believe it or not, across these different sectors, there are many of them face the same functional problems, right? Whether it's around a cloud, right? It can be something specific as autonomy um, or any number of other, you know, higher end technologies. Right. But the learned experience of fast innovation on the commercial side is sometimes helpful on the defense side. The learned experience of doing security right on the defense side is sometimes very helpful on the commercial side, right? And so Absolutely. mixing those together sometimes is very useful. Yeah, with that, the last question is, so NDIA's got big companies as members, small companies as members, universities, government individuals, government laboratories. You guys are a member. Your competitors are members. If they wanted to work with you, what's the best way to sort of think about it and find you and reach out? Yeah, I think, you know, we've got a lot of a, a public presence out there. I mean, the website's a great place to start. I mean, I'm happy to take uh, any emails through, you know, LinkedIn and, and connections. But uh, you're absolutely right. I, I, we are uh, 
very open company. We have connectivity and uh, close relationships with many other companies in this space. And so I don't think at any company out there should be afraid to at least reach out and see if the sector that you're working in is something that aligns well to what we do. With that, Randy, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast and this great discussion. Arun, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for watching this week's episode of Emerging Tech Horizons. Uh, I want to make sure everyone's watching the NDIA and ETI websites for all our upcoming events, conferences, workshops, webinars, our short courses, uh, and future podcasts. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Please email your ideas for future episodes. Uh, I want to do a special thank you to Melanie Yu and Daniel Park for producing this episode. Thanks, Randy, again for joining us. And thank you all so much for joining us on Emerging Tech Horizons.